James Harold Wilson, Baron Wilson of Revox, was a British politician who was Prime Minister of the United Kingdom twice, from October 1964 to June 1970, and again from March 1974 to April 1976. He was the leader of the Labour Party from 1963 to 1976, and was a Member of Parliament from 1945 to 1983. Wilson is the only Labour leader to have formed Labour administrations following four general elections. Born in Huddersfield, Yorkshire, to a politically active middle-class family, Wilson won a scholarship to attend Royds Hall Grammar School and went on to study modern history at Jesus College, Oxford. He was later an economic history lecturer at New College, Oxford and a research fellow at University College, Oxford. Elected to Parliament in 1945 for the seat of Ormskirk, Wilson was immediately appointed to the Attlee government as a parliamentary secretary, he became secretary for overseas trade in 1947, and was elevated to the cabinet shortly thereafter as president of the Board of Trade. In 1950, he moved to represent the nearby seat of Haydn. Following Labour's defeat at the 1955 election, Wilson joined the Shadow Cabinet as Shadow Chancellor, and was moved to the role of Shadow Foreign Secretary in 1961. When Labour leader Hugh Gateskill died suddenly in January 1963, Wilson won the subsequent leadership election to replace him, becoming leader of the opposition. Wilson led Labour to a narrow victory at the 1964 election, and was appointed Prime Minister. His first period as Prime Minister saw a period of low unemployment and relative economic prosperity, although this would later become hindered by significant problems with Britain's external balance of payments. The Wilson government oversaw significant societal changes in the United Kingdom, abolishing both capital punishment and theatre censorship, decriminalising male homosexuality in England and Wales relaxing the divorce laws and liberalising birth control and abortion law. In the midst of this programme Wilson called a snap election in 1966, which Labour won by a landslide. In 1969, he sent British troops to Northern Ireland. Despite leading in opinion polls, Labour unexpectedly lost the 1970 election to Edward Heath's Conservatives. Wilson chose to remain in the Labour leadership, and spent four years back in the role of leader of the opposition before leading Labour through the February 1974 election, which resulted in a hung parliament. Although the Conservatives had won more votes than Labour, Heath's talks with the Liberal Party failed, and Wilson was appointed Prime Minister for a second time, now as leader of a minority government. Wilson called a snap election in October 1974, which gave Labour a small majority. During his second term as Prime Minister, Wilson oversaw the referendum that confirmed the UK's membership of the European communities. In March 1976 he suddenly announced his resignation as Prime Minister, and was succeeded by James Callaghan. Wilson remained in the House of Commons until retiring in 1983 when he was elevated to the House of Lords as Lord Wilson of Revox. Historians evaluate him in terms of leading the Labour Party through difficult political issues with considerable skill. Wilson's reputation was low when he left office and was still poor in 2016. Key issues he faced included the role of public ownership, membership of the European communities, and how to avoid committing British troops to the Vietnam War. Wilson's approach to socialism was regarded by some as too moderate, by others too left-wing. A member of Labour's soft left, he joked about leading a cabinet made up mostly of social democrats, comparing himself to a Bolshevik revolutionary presiding over a czarist cabinet, but there was little to divide him ideologically from the majority of his cabinet. His stated ambitions of substantially improving Britain's long-term economic performance applying technology more democratically, and reducing inequality went to some extent unfulfilled. Early Life Wilson was born at Warnford Road, Cowler Slay, 
in the western suburbs of the mill town of Huddersfield, in the West Riding of Yorkshire, England, on March 11, 1916. He came from a political family, his father James Herbert Wilson was a works chemist who had been active in the Liberal Party, going as far as to be Winston Churchill's deputy election agent in a 1908 by-election, but later joined the Labour Party. His mother Ethel was a schoolteacher before her marriage. In 1901 her brother Harold Seddon settled in Western Australia and became a local political leader. When Wilson was eight, he visited London and a much reproduced photograph was taken of him standing on the doorstep of 10 Downing Street. At the age of 10, he went with his family to Australia, where he became fascinated with the pomp and glamour of politics. On the way home, he told his mother, I am going to be Prime Minister. Education Wilson won a scholarship to attend Royds Hall Grammar School, his local grammar school in Huddersfield in Yorkshire. His father, working as an industrial chemist, was made redundant in December 1930, and it took him nearly two years to find work, he moved to Spittle in Cheshire, on the Whirl, to do so. Wilson continued his education in the sixth form at the Whirl Grammar School for Boys, where he became head boy. Wilson did well at school and, although he missed getting a scholarship, he obtained an exhibition, this, when topped up by a county grant, enabled him to study modern history at Jesus College, Oxford, from 1934. At Oxford, Wilson was moderately active in politics as a member of the Liberal Party but was strongly influenced by G. D. H. Cole. His politics tutor, R. B. McCallum, considered Wilson as the best student he ever had. He graduated in PPE with an outstanding first-class Bachelor of Arts degree, with alphas on every paper in the final examinations, and a series of major academic awards. Biographer Roy Jenkins wrote, Academically his results put him among prime ministers in the category of Peel, Gladstone, Asquith, and no one else. But, he lacked originality. What he was superb at was the quick assimilation of knowledge, combined with an ability to keep it ordered in his mind and to present it lucidly in a form welcome to his examiners. He continued in academia, becoming one of the youngest Oxford dons of the century at the age of 21. He was a lecturer in economic history at New College from 1937, and a research fellow at University College. Marriage On New Year's Day 1940, in the chapel of Mansfield College, Oxford, he married Mary Baldwin, who remained his wife until his death. Mary Wilson became a published poet. They had two sons, Robin and Giles. Robin became a professor of mathematics, and Giles became a teacher and later a train driver. In their twenties, his sons were under a kidnap threat from the IRA because of their father's prominence. War Service On the outbreak of the Second World War, Wilson volunteered for military service but was classed as a specialist and moved into the civil service instead. For much of this time, he was a research assistant to William Beveridge, the master of University College, working on the issues of unemployment and the trade cycle. Wilson later became a statistician and economist for the coal industry. He was director of economics and statistics at the Ministry of Fuel and Power in 1943-44 and was made an OBE for his services. He was to remain passionately interested in statistics becoming a fellow of the Royal Statistical Society in 1943. As President of the Board of Trade, he was the driving force behind the Statistics of Trade Act 1947, which is still the authority governing most economic statistics in Great Britain. He was instrumental as Prime Minister in appointing Klaus Moser as head of the Central Statistical Office, and was president of the Royal Statistical Society between 1972 and 1973. Member of Parliament As the war drew to an end, he searched for a seat to contest at the impending general election. He was selected for the constituency of Ormskirk, then held by Stephen King Hall. 
Wilson agreed to be adopted as the candidate immediately rather than delay until the election was called, and was therefore compelled to resign from his position in the civil service. He served as prelector in economics at University College between his resignation and his election to the House of Commons. He also used this time to write a new deal for coal, which used his wartime experience to argue for the nationalization of the coal mines on the grounds of the improved efficiency he predicted would ensue. In the 1945 general election, Wilson won his seat in the Labour landslide. To his surprise, he was immediately appointed to the government by Prime Minister Clement Attlee as Parliamentary Secretary to the Ministry of Works. Two years later, he became Secretary for Overseas Trade, in which capacity he made several official trips to the Soviet Union to negotiate supply contracts. The boundaries of his Ormskirk constituency were significantly altered before the general election of 1950. He stood instead for the new seat of Haydn near Liverpool, and was narrowly elected, he served there for 33 years until 1983. Cabinet Minister, 1947-1951 Bonfire of Controls Three Ambitious Young Men Shadow Cabinet, 1954-1963 Wilson had never made much secret that his support of the left-wing Anurin Bevan was opportunistic. In early 1954, Bevan resigned from the Shadow Cabinet over Labour's support for the setting up of the Southeast Asia Treaty Organization. Wilson, who had been runner-up in the elections, stepped up to fill the vacant place. He was supported in this by Richard Crossman, but his actions angered Bevan and the other Bevanites. Wilson's course in intraparty matters in the 1950s and early 1960s left him neither fully accepted nor trusted by the left or the right in the Labour Party. Despite his earlier association with Bevan, in 1955 he backed Hugh Gateskill, the right-wing candidate in internal Labour Party terms, against Bevan for the party leadership election. Gateskill appointed him Shadow Chancellor of the Exchequer in 1955, and he proved to be very effective. One of his procedural moves caused a substantial delay to the progress of the government's finance bill in 1955, and his speeches as Shadow Chancellor from 1956 were widely praised for their clarity and wit. He coined the term Gnomes of Zurich to ridicule Swiss bankers for selling Britain short and pushing the pound sterling down by speculation. He conducted an inquiry into the Labour Party's organisation following its defeat in the 1955 general election, its report compared Labour's organisation to an antiquated penny-farthing bicycle, and made various recommendations for improvements. Unusually, Wilson combined the job of Chairman of the House of Commons Public Accounts Committee with that of Shadow Chancellor from 1959, holding that position until 1963. Gateskill's leadership was weakened after the Labour Party's 1959 defeat, his controversial attempt to ditch Labour's commitment to nationalisation by scrapping Clause 4, and his defeat at the 1960 party conference over a motion supporting unilateral nuclear disarmament. Bevan had died in July 1960, so Wilson established himself as a leader of the Labour left by launching an opportunistic but unsuccessful challenge to Gateskill's leadership in November 1960. Wilson would later be moved to the position of Shadow Foreign Secretary in 1961, before he challenged for the deputy leadership in 1962 but was defeated by George Brown. Opposition Leader 1963-64 Gateskill died in January 1963, just as the Labour Party had begun to unite and appeared to have a very good chance of winning the next election, with the Macmillan government running into trouble. Timothy Heppel has explored how Wilson won the Labour Party leadership election. Wilson had alienated the right wing of the party by his angry attempts to defeat Gateskill in 1960 for the leadership and George Brown in 1962 for the deputy leadership. These misadventures gave Wilson a reputation for disloyalty and divisiveness. Heppel identifies three factors whereby Wilson overcame these disadvantages. Firstly, 
he had united the party's left wing behind him and they showed no willingness to compromise. Secondly, the right wing, although more numerous, was deeply split between Brown and James Callaghan. Wilson took the lead on the first ballot and gained momentum on the second. Finally, Brown proved a poor campaigner, emphasizing divisive factors rather than his own credentials, allowing Wilson to emerge, surprisingly, as the unity candidate, thus becoming the leader of the Labour Party and the leader of the opposition. At the party's 1963 annual conference, Wilson made his best remembered speech on the implications of scientific and technological change. He argued that the Britain that is going to be forged in the white heat of this revolution will be no place for restrictive practices or for outdated measures on either side of industry. This speech did much to set Wilson's reputation as a technocrat not tied to the prevailing class system. Labour's 1964 election campaign was aided by the Profumo affair, a ministerial sex scandal that had mortally wounded Harold Macmillan and hurt the Conservatives. Wilson made capital without getting involved in the less salubrious aspects. Sir Alec Douglas Home was an aristocrat who had given up his peerage to sit in the House of Commons and become Prime Minister upon Macmillan's resignation. To Wilson's comment that he was out of touch with ordinary people since he was the 14th Earl of Home, Home retorted, I suppose Mr. Wilson is the 14th Mr. Wilson. First period as Prime Minister Labour won the 1964 general election with a narrow majority of four seats, and Wilson became Prime Minister, the youngest person to hold that office since Lord Rosebery 70 years earlier. During 1965, by-election losses reduced the government's majority to a single seat, but in March 1966 Wilson took the gamble of calling another general election. The gamble paid off because this time Labour achieved a 96-seat majority over the Conservatives, who the previous year had made Edward Heath their leader. Domestic Affairs The 1964-1970 Labour government carried out a broad range of reforms during its time in office, in such areas as social security, civil liberties, housing, health, education, and workers' rights. It is perhaps best remembered for the liberal social reforms introduced or supported by Home Secretary Roy Jenkins. Notable amongst these was the partial decriminalization of male homosexuality and abortion, reform of divorce laws, the abolition of theater censorship and capital punishment and various pieces of legislation addressing race relations and racial discrimination. His government also undertook the easing of means testing for non-contributory welfare benefits, the linking of pensions to earnings, and the provision of industrial injury benefits. Wilson's government also made significant reforms to education, most notably the expansion of comprehensive education and the creation of the open university. Economic policies Social issues Education Wilson won a scholarship to attend Royds Hall Grammar School, his local grammar school in Huddersfield in Yorkshire. His father, working as an industrial chemist, was made redundant in December 1930, and it took him nearly two years to find work, he moved to Spittal in Cheshire, on the Whirl, to do so. Wilson continued his education in the sixth form at the Whirl Grammar School for Boys, where he became head boy. Wilson did well at school and, although he missed getting a scholarship, he obtained an exhibition, this, when topped up by a county grant, enabled him to study modern history at Jesus College, Oxford, from 1934. At Oxford, Wilson was moderately active in politics as a member of the Liberal Party but was strongly influenced by G. D. H. Cole. His politics tutor, R. B. McCallum, considered Wilson as the best student he ever had. He graduated in PPE with an outstanding first-class Bachelor of Arts degree, with alphas on every paper in the final examinations, and a series of major academic awards. Biographer Roy Jenkins wrote, Academically his results put him among prime ministers in the category of Peel, Gladstone, Asquith, and no one else. But, he lacked originality. 
What he was superb at was the quick assimilation of knowledge, combined with an ability to keep it ordered in his mind and to present it lucidly in a form welcome to his examiners. He continued in academia, becoming one of the youngest Oxford dons of the century at the age of 21. He was a lecturer in economic history at New College from 1937, and a research fellow at University College. Housing Urban Renewal Social Services and Welfare Agriculture Health Workers Transport Regional Development International Development Taxation Liberal Reforms Industrial Relations Record on Income Distribution External Affairs United States Europe Asia Africa Defeat and Return to Opposition, 1970-1974 By 1969, the Labour Party was suffering serious electoral reverses, and by the turn of 1970 had lost a total of 16 seats in by-elections since the previous general election. By 1970, the economy was showing signs of improvement, and by May that year, Labour had overtaken the Conservatives in the opinion polls. Wilson responded to this apparent recovery in his government's popularity by calling a general election, but, to the surprise of most observers, was defeated at the polls by the Conservatives under Heath. Most opinion polls had predicted a Labour win, with the poll six days before the election showing a 12.4% Labour lead. Writing in the aftermath of the election, the Times journalist George Clark wrote that the 1970 contest would be remembered as the occasion when the people of the United Kingdom hurled the findings of the opinion polls back into the faces of the pollsters and at the voting booths proved them wrong most of them badly wrong. Heath and the Conservatives had attacked Wilson over the economy. Towards the end of the campaign, bad trade figures for May added weight to Heath's campaign and he claimed that a Labour victory would result in a further devaluation. Wilson considered Heath's claims irresponsible and damaging to the nation. Ultimately, however, the election saw Labour's vote share fall to its lowest since 1935. Several prominent Labour figures lost their seats notably George Brown who was still deputy leader of the Labour Party. Wilson survived as leader of the Labour Party in opposition. In mid-1973, holidaying on the Isles of Scilly, he tried to board a motorboat from a dinghy and stepped into the sea. He was unable to get into the boat and was left in the cold water, hanging on to the fenders of the motorboat. He was close to death before he was saved by the father of novelist Isabel Wolfe. The incident was taken up by the press and resulted in some embarrassment for Wilson, his press secretary, Joe Haynes, tried to deflect some of the comment by blaming Wilson's dog Patty for the problem. Economic conditions during the 1970s were becoming more difficult for Britain and many other Western economies as a result of the Nixon shock and the 1973 oil crisis and the Heath government in its turn was buffeted by economic adversity and industrial unrest towards the end of 1973, and on 7. February 1974 Heath called a snap election for February 28. Second period as Prime Minister Labour won more seats than the Conservative Party in the general election in February 1974, which resulted in a hung parliament. As Heath was unable to persuade the Liberals to form a coalition, Wilson returned to 10 Downing Street on March 4, 1974 as Prime Minister of a minority Labour government. He gained a three-seat majority in another election later that year, on October 10, 1974. One of the key issues addressed during his second period in office was the referendum on British membership of the European Community which took place in June 1975, Labour had pledged in its February 1974 manifesto to renegotiate the terms of British accession to the EC, and then to consult the public in a referendum on whether Britain should stay in on the new terms. Although the government recommended a vote in favour of continued membership, the cabinet was split on the issue, 
and ministers were allowed to campaign on different sides of the question. The referendum resulted in a near two-to-one majority in favor of Britain remaining in the EC. Domestic Affairs the 1964-1970 Labour government carried out a broad range of reforms during its time in office, in such areas as social security, civil liberties, housing, health, education, and workers' rights. It is perhaps best remembered for the liberal social reforms introduced or supported by Home Secretary Roy Jenkins. Notable amongst these was the partial decriminalization of male homosexuality and abortion, reform of divorce laws, the abolition of theater censorship and capital punishment and various pieces of legislation addressing race relations and racial discrimination. His government also undertook the easing of means testing for non contributory welfare benefits, the linking of pensions to earnings, and the provision of industrial injury benefits. Wilson's government also made significant reforms to education most notably the expansion of comprehensive education and the creation of the Open University. Northern Ireland Wilson's earlier government had witnessed the outbreak of the Troubles in Northern Ireland. In response to a request from the government of Northern Ireland, Wilson agreed to deploy the British Army in August 1969 to restore the peace. While out of office in late 1971, Wilson had formulated a 16-point, 15-year program that was designed to pave the way for the unification of Ireland. The proposal was not adopted by the then Heath government. In May 1974, when back in office as leader of a minority government, Wilson condemned the unionist-controlled Ulster Workers' Council strike as a sectarian strike, which was being done for sectarian purposes having no relation to this century but only to the 17th century. He refused to pressure a reluctant British army to face down the Ulster loyalist paramilitaries who were intimidating utility workers. In a televised speech later, he referred to the loyalist strikers and their supporters as spongers who expected Britain to pay for their lifestyles. The strike was eventually successful in breaking the power-sharing Northern Ireland executive. On September 11, 2008, BBC Radio 4's document programme claimed to have unearthed a secret plan code named Doomsday which proposed to cut all of the United Kingdom's constitutional ties with Northern Ireland and transform the province into an independent dominion. Document went on to claim that the Doomsday Plan was devised mainly by Wilson and was kept a closely guarded secret. The plan then allegedly lost momentum, due in part, it was claimed, to warnings made by both the then Foreign Secretary, James Callaghan, and the then Irish Minister for Foreign Affairs Garrett Fitzgerald who admitted the 12,000-strong Irish Army would be unable to deal with the ensuing civil war. Later. Callaghan himself spoke and wrote despondently about the prospect for a British-derived solution to the Northern Ireland issue, supporting a similar plan to push Northern Ireland towards independent status. In 1975, Wilson secretly offered Libya's dictator Muammar Gaddafi £14 million to stop arming the Provisional Irish Republican Army, but Gaddafi demanded a far greater sum of money. This offer did not become publicly known until 2009. Resignation When Wilson entered office for the second time, he had privately admitted that he had lost his enthusiasm for the role, telling a close advisor in 1974 that I have been around this racetrack so often that I cannot generate any more enthusiasm for jumping any more hurdles. On March 16, 1976, Wilson announced his resignation as Prime Minister. He claimed that he had always planned on resigning at the age of 60 and that he was physically and mentally exhausted. As early as the late 1960s he had been telling intimates, like his doctor Sir Joseph Stone, that he did not intend to serve more than eight or nine years as Prime Minister. Roy Jenkins has suggested that Wilson may have been motivated partly by the distaste for politics felt by his loyal and long-suffering wife, Mary. His doctor had detected problems which would later be diagnosed as colon cancer, and Wilson had begun drinking brandy during the day to cope with stress. In addition, 
by 1976 he might already have been aware of the first stages of early onset Alzheimer's disease, which was to cause both his formerly excellent memory and his powers of concentration to fail dramatically. Wilson's Prime Minister's resignation honors included many businessmen and celebrities, along with his political supporters. His choice of appointments caused lasting damage to his reputation, worsened by the suggestion that the first draft of the list had been written by his political secretary Marcia Williams on lavender notepaper. Roy Jenkins noted that Wilson's retirement was disfigured by his, at best, eccentric resignation honors list, which gave peerages or knighthoods to some adventurous business gentlemen, several of whom were close neither to him nor to the Labour Party. Some of those whom Wilson honored included Lord Kagan, the inventor of Gannex, who was eventually imprisoned for fraud, and Sir Eric Miller, who later committed suicide while under police investigation for corruption. The Labour Party held an election to replace Wilson as leader of the party. Six candidates stood in the first ballot, in order of votes they were, Michael Foote, James Callaghan, Roy Jenkins, Tony Benn, Dennis Healy, and Anthony Crossland. In the third ballot, on April 5, Callaghan defeated Foote in a parliamentary vote of 176 to 137, thus becoming Wilson's successor as Prime Minister and leader of the Labour Party, and he continued to serve as Prime Minister until May 1979. As Wilson wished to remain an MP after leaving office, he was not immediately given the peerage customarily offered to retired prime ministers, but instead was created a Knight of the Garter. Following his departure from the House of Commons before the 1983 general election, he was granted a life peerage as Baron Wilson of Revolks, of Kirklees in the county of West Yorkshire, after Revolks Abbey, in the north of his native Yorkshire, and Kirklees the metropolitan borough which includes his hometown of Huddersfield. Retirement and Death, 1976-1995 He was appointed in 1976 to chair the committee to review the functioning of financial institutions which reported in June 1980. Shortly after resigning as Prime Minister, Wilson was signed by David Frost to host a series of interviews-slash-chat show programs. The pilot episode proved to be a flop as Wilson appeared uncomfortable with the informality of the format. Wilson also hosted two editions of the BBC chat show Friday night, Saturday morning. He famously floundered in the role, and in 2000, Channel 4 chose one of his appearances as one of the 100 moments of TV hell. A lifelong Gilbert and Sullivan fan, in 1975, Wilson joined the board of trustees of the Deoily Card Trust at the invitation of Sir Hugh Wontner, who was then the Lord Mayor of London. At Christmas 1978, Wilson appeared on the Morecambe and Wise Christmas special. Eric Morecambe's habit of appearing not to recognize the guest stars was repaid by Wilson, who referred to him throughout as Mori Camby. Wilson appeared on the show again in 1980. Wilson was not especially active in the House of Lords, although he did initiate a debate on unemployment in May 1984. His last speech was in a debate on marine pilotage in 1986, when he commented as an elder brother of Trinity House. In the same year he played himself as Prime Minister in an Anglia television drama, Inside Story. Wilson continued regularly attending the House of Lords until just over a year before his death, the last sitting he attended was on April 27, 1994. He had a picture taken with other Labour Lords on June 15, 1994, just under a year before his death. He died from colon cancer and Alzheimer's disease on May 24, 1995, aged 79. His death came five months before that of his predecessor Alec Douglas Home. Wilson's memorial service was held in Westminster Abbey on July 13, 1995. It was attended by the Prince of Wales, former Prime Ministers Edward Heath, James Callaghan and Margaret Thatcher, incumbent Prime Minister John Major and also Tony Blair, then leader of the opposition and later Prime Minister. 
Wilson was buried at St. Mary's Old Church, St. Mary's, Isles of Scilly, on June 6. His epitaph is Tempus Imperator Rerum. Political Style Wilson regarded himself as a man of the people and did much to promote this image, contrasting himself with the stereotypical aristocratic conservatives and other statesmen who had preceded him, as an example of social mobility. He largely retained his Yorkshire accent. Other features of this persona included his working man's Ganex raincoat, his pipe, his love of simple cooking and fondness for popular British relish HP sauce, and his support for his hometown's football team, Huddersfield Town. His first general election victory relied heavily on associating these down-to-earth attributes with a sense that the UK urgently needed to modernise after 13 years of Tory misrule. Wilson exhibited his populist touch in June 1965 when he had the Beatles honoured with the award of MBE. The award was popular with young people and contributed to a sense that the Prime Minister was in touch with the younger generation. There were some protests by conservatives and elderly members of the military who were earlier recipients of the award, but such protesters were in the minority. Critics claimed that Wilson acted to solicit votes for the next general election, but defenders noted that, since the minimum voting age at that time was 21, this was hardly likely to impact many of the Beatles fans who at that time were predominantly teenagers. It cemented Wilson's image as a modernistic leader and linked him to the burgeoning pride in the New Britain typified by the Beatles. The Beatles mentioned Wilson rather negatively, naming both him and his opponent Edward Heath in George Harrison's song Taxman, the opener to 1960 SIXS Revolver recorded and released after the MBEs. In 1967, Wilson had a different interaction with a musical ensemble. He sued the pop group The Move for libel after the band's manager Tony Secunda published a promotional postcard for the single Flowers in the Rain, featuring a caricature depicting Wilson in bed with his female assistant, Marcia Williams. Gossip had hinted at an improper relationship, though these rumors were never substantiated. Wilson won the case, and all royalties from the song were assigned in perpetuity to a charity of Wilson's choosing. Wilson coined the term Selston Man to refer to the free market policies of the conservative leader Edward Heath, developed at a policy retreat held at the Selston Park Hotel in early 1970. This phrase, intended to evoke the primitive throwback qualities of anthropological discoveries such as Piltdown Man and Swan's Coombe Man, was part of a British political tradition of referring to political trends by suffixing man. Other memorable phrases attributed to Wilson include the white heat of the revolution, and a week is a long time in politics, meaning that political fortunes can change extremely rapidly. In his broadcast after the 1967 devaluation of the pound, Wilson said, this does not mean that the pound here in Britain in your pocket or purse is worth any less and the phrase the pound in your pocket subsequently took on a life of its own. Reputation Despite his successes, Wilson's reputation took a long time to start a recovery from the low ebb reached immediately following his second premiership. The reinvention of the Labour Party would take the better part of two decades at the hands of Neil Kinnock, John Smith and electorally and most conclusively, Tony Blair. Disillusion with Britain's weak economic performance and troubled industrial relations, combined with active spadework by figures such as Sir Keith Joseph, had helped to make a radical market program politically feasible for Margaret Thatcher. An opinion poll in September 2011 found that Wilson came in third place when respondents were asked to name the best post-war Labour Party leader. He was beaten only by John Smith and Tony Blair. According to Glenn O'Hara in 2006, much of the disillusionment with Harold Wilson as Labour's leader and Prime Minister was due to his perceived failure on the economic front. He pledged not to devalue sterling, but did exactly that in 1967. He promised to keep unemployment low, but had by 1970 accepted a higher rate of joblessness than the Conservatives had managed. Some of the elements in Labour's programme the emphasis on steadier growth, 
for instance were probably misguided. These problems and defeats have, however, obscured some of the real achievements of the period. Science and education spending grew very quickly, industrial investment rose, government was increasingly well informed and better advised about the performance of the economy. In an increasingly unstable and rapidly changing economic environment, this government's economic record is here shown to be, if not hugely impressive, then at least relatively creditable. Possible Plots and Conspiracy Theories In 1963, Soviet defector Anatolia Igolitsyn is said to have secretly claimed that Wilson was a KGB agent. The majority of intelligence officers did not believe that Golitsyn was credible in this and various other claims, but a significant number did and factional strife broke out between the two groups. Former MI5 officer Peter Wright claimed in his memoirs, Spy Catcher, that 30 MI5 agents then collaborated in an attempt to undermine Wilson. He retracted that claim, saying there was only one man. In March 1987, James Miller, a former agent, claimed that the Ulster Workers' Council strike of 1974 had been promoted by MI5 to help destabilize Wilson's government. In July 1987, Labour MP Ken Livingstone used his maiden speech to raise the 1975 allegations of a former Army press officer in Northern Ireland, Colin Wallace, who also alleged a plot to destabilize Wilson. Chris Mullen MP, speaking on November 23, 1988, argued that sources other than Peter Wright supported claims of a long-standing attempt by MI5 to undermine Wilson's government. On the BBC television program The Plot Against Harold Wilson, broadcast on March 16, 2006 on BBC2, it was claimed there were threats of a coup d'état against the Wilson government, which were corroborated by leading figures of the time on both the left and the right. Wilson told two BBC journalists, Barry Penrose and Roger Korshower, who recorded the meetings on a cassette tape recorder, that he feared he was being undermined by MI5. The first time was in the late 1960s after the Wilson government devalued the pound sterling but the threat faded after conservative leader Edward Heath won the election of 1970. However, after the 1972 British miners' strike Heath decided to hold an election to renew his mandate to govern in February 1974 but lost narrowly to Wilson. There was again talk of a military coup with rumors of Lord Mountbatten as head of an interim administration after Wilson had been deposed. In 1974, the British Army occupied Heathrow Airport on the grounds of training for possible IRA terrorist action at the airport. Although the military stated that this was a planned military exercise, 10 Downing Street was not informed Indiana advance and Wilson himself interpreted it as a show of strength, or warning being made by the Army. Historian Christopher Andrews' official history of MI5, The Defense of the Realm, the authorized history of MI5, included a chapter specifically alluding to a conspiracy instead of a plot against Wilson in the 1970s. The characterization of Harold Wilson as paranoid does not take account of the political context of the time which was characterized by a paranoid political style generally which applied to both left and right. The suspicion of Wilson and others towards the unlawful activities of the security services and other right-wing figures resulted from concrete domestic and international developments discussed in more detail below. Andrew is correct to be skeptical, and there remains limited evidence of a plot if a plot is defined as a tightly organized high-level conspiracy with a detailed plan. However, there is evidence of a conspiracy, a loosely connected series of unlawful maneuvers against an elected government by a group of like-minded figures. The Director General of the Security Service assured Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher, and she told the House of Commons on May 6, 1987. He has found no evidence of any truth in the allegations. He has given me his personal assurance that the stories are false. In particular, he has advised me that all the security service officers who have been interviewed have categorically denied that they were involved in, or were aware of, 
any activities or plans to undermine or discredit Lord Wilson and his government when he was Prime Minister. In 2009, the defense of the realm held that while MI5 kept a file on Wilson from 1945 when he became an MP because communist civil servants claimed that he had similar political sympathies there was no bugging of his home or office, and no conspiracy against him. In 2010 newspaper reports made detailed allegations that the cabinet office had required that the section on bugging of 10 Downing Street be omitted from the history for wider public interest reasons. In 1963, on Macmillan's orders following the Profumo affair, MI5 bugged the cabinet room, the waiting room, and the Prime Minister's study until the devices were removed in 1977 on Callahan's orders. From the records, it is unclear if Wilson or Heath knew of the bugging, and no recorded conversations were retained by MI5 so possibly the bugs were never activated. Professor Andrew had previously recorded in the preface of the history that one significant excision as a result of these requirements is, I believe, hard to justify, giving credence to these new allegations. As a result of his concerns about the danger to British parliamentary democracy from these activities, Wilson issued instructions that no agency should ever bug the telephones of any members of Parliament, a policy which came to be known as the Wilson Doctrine. Honours. Wilson was elected a Fellow of the Royal Society in 1969 under Statute 12 of the Society's Regulations, which covers people who have rendered conspicuous service to the cause of science or are such that their election would be of signal benefit to the Society. Statues and Other Tributes A Portrait of Harold Wilson, painted by the Scottish portrait artist Cowan Dobson, hangs today at University College. Oxford. Two statues of Harold Wilson stand in prominent places. The first, unveiled by the then Prime Minister Tony Blair in July 1999, stands outside Huddersfield Railway Station in St. George's Square, Huddersfield. Costing £70,000, the statue, designed by sculptor Ian Walters, is based on photographs taken in 1964 and depicts Wilson in walking pose at the start of his first term as Prime Minister. His widow, Mary requested that the eight-foot-tall monument not show Wilson holding his famous pipe as she feared it would make the representation a caricature. A block of high-rise flats owned by Kirkley's Metropolitan District Council in Huddersfield is named after Wilson. In September 2006, Tony Blair unveiled a second bronze statue of Wilson in the latter's former constituency of Hyden, near Liverpool. The statue was created by Liverpool sculptor Tom Murphy and Blair paid tribute to Wilson's legacy at the unveiling, including the Open University. He added, he also brought in a whole new culture, a whole new country. He made the country very, very different. Also in 2006, a street on a new housing development in TV Dale, West Midlands, was named Wilson Drive in honor of Wilson. Along with neighboring new development Callahan Drive, it formed part of a large housing estate developed since the 1960s where all streets were named after former prime ministers or senior parliamentary figures. Scholastic Honors Chancellor, Visitor, Governor, and Fellowships Honorary Degrees Cultural Depictions See also History of the British Labour Party Lord Goodman References Further reading Bibliography Wilson, Harold A Personal Record, The Labour Government, 1964-1970 Wilson, Harold The Labour Government 1964-1970 a Personal Record Biographical Far, Martin Wilson, Harold, 1st Baron Wilson 1916-1995 and David Lodes, ed., Reader's Guide to British History London, Routledge, 2003 Online at Credo Reference, Historiography Jenkins, Roy Wilson, Harold Baron Wilson of Revolks. 
Oxford Dictionary of National Biography Oxford University Press doi 10.1093 slash ref odd slash 58000 r Pimlet, Ben Harold Wilson Harper Collins ISBN 978-0-00-215189-4-830 pp, a standard scholarly biography. Routledge, Paul. Wilson. Series, The Twenty British Prime Ministers of the Twentieth Century. House Publishing. ISBN 978-1-904950-68-4 Ziegler, Philip Wilson, The Authorized Life of Lord Wilson of Revolx Weidenfeld and Nicholson ISBN 978-0-297-81276-0, The Authorized Biography